Today we'll start a project that will demonstrate a lot of ideas for making landscape quilts, including several techniques I haven't shown much before, like turned edge applique. And Odette, my Bernina 880, will be back in this video to lend a hand. You can always use the help. Landscape quilts are some of the most common pictorial art quilts. There's something that just seems right about an art quilt with some rolling mountains, grasses, bushes, and trees in the distance, and some interesting foreground. Maybe you should do something with evergreen trees. Back when you did a tutorial on deciduous trees, you promised to show evergreens later. Now's the time to make good on that promise. Maybe we'll have a cliff with some trees overlooking a valley and some distant mountains. I'll bring up some actual landscape images to help. I think what you can see is that all these scenes have some things in common. The sky tends to be lighter near the horizon and darkens as it gets higher. And each line of hills or mountains gets lighter and grayer as it gets further away. And in the foreground, the trees are pretty dark and clear. Okay, let's see what I can do with this. It took me some time, but I created a pattern for a skill building project just like the one we talked about. I've uploaded the pattern to your website store so people who want to can follow along making this. I'm hoping people enjoy making it. The pattern calls for a sky background, three rows of distant hills and mountains, a tree line in the midground, and a cliff in the foreground that will support some large evergreen trees. Will the foreground trees be applique as well? Not exactly. I have a new technique to show for making those. But let's keep things simple for now and start by working just on the background. So what's first? We need to pick some fabrics and threads that fit with the project. I think we're mostly going to want solid colors, but they need to be the right ones. In that case, I'll start Corel Painter to help us talk about color models. You mean like a color wheel with primary colors versus secondary colors, so you can see what colors complement what? Not exactly. You need a model that helps you identify a specific color. And for landscape quilts, the most important model is called hue, saturation, and value or HSV. Why this one? You saw in the footage how each line of mountains looked lighter the further away it was. That's the color value. Quilters work with the value of a fabric's color a lot. Even when you switch a fabric with a different color, like a red versus a blue, you know it might not have a lot of contrast if the value of the color is the same. In this model, we call that the hue. And like you just said, you can change that without changing the color's value. It's a completely different dimension for measuring it. So that leaves us with saturation. Saturation is the measure of how vivid the color is versus how much gray is mixed into it. A purer color is more saturated, but the saturation can go all the way down to zero. At that point, you're just talking about a value of gray all by itself. So for our mountain ranges, we want a selection of colors that probably have about the same hue, but progressively lighter values and lower saturation. It sounds like you're ready to go fabric shopping. Not yet. First, let's cut out the assembly guide for the pattern. That will show me just how much fabric I need. You are no fun. So this is the same process as for any of my patterns, cutting along the edges of the printed section and taping them together where they are marked. Hopefully you have better luck with your rotary cutter this time than last. Hey, I've made this as foolproof as possible. Print all six pages, obviously with no resizing. There are both alignment marks and a grid to help line the pages up with each other. I'm going to trim the edges I need off each of the pages, then tape them together.
Now is it time to get the fabric? Yes, now it's time to go shopping. At this point I have all my fabrics chosen. For the sky, I picked a Robert Kaufman fabric designed by Jennifer Sampu that's really made for this kind of use. It already has a graduated shading to it that looks just like sky. Which part of the gradient fabric do you want to use? Some parts of it are darker than others. I'm using my placement guide to help me choose. Lining the guide up with the fabric looking back and forth helps me see what the sky would look like, so I can find just the section I want. Now I'm going to clip and then tear. Tearing rather than cutting. Not even scissors. This is a trick I learned as a seamstress. Tearing follows straight along the grain line of the fabric, and that's important here because it keeps the top and side edges of the fabric parallel to the edges of our pattern, with the grain of the fabric perfectly aligned. Do you want to line up the other fabrics now, so people can see the progression of colors? Yes, thanks. One is very light and neutral. This will go in the back. The next has a little more green and a little more value to the fabric. The third is kind of an olive green, and the fourth a pattern fabric for our tree line, and the final fabric is a patterned gray. This one will create the rocky ledge in the foreground that our foreground trees will stand on. And the little piece of brown. That's for an edge of the cliff that winds around so it's visible in the picture. You don't need much of it. Before we cut our pieces out of the fabrics we've chosen, we need to back the fabrics for our tree line with some fusible web. Off camera, I cut a piece of the green patterned fabric we chose for this to just about 12 inches by 24 inches. I put it right side down, and I'm going to iron it completely flat to start with. Which fusible web are you going to use? I think for this I'll use heat and bond light. I use Stima Seam when I want to be able to test position and applique and move it around, but that won't be needed here. In that case, the directions call for medium heat on the iron. Once you have the iron set right, make sure the paper liner faces toward you, and you can just start ironing the heat and bond down. The piece I cut is just a little smaller than the fabric, about 11 and a half by 23 inches. After we have this ironed on, we'll trim the edges of the fabric to match. How do you know when it's completely ironed on? That's a good question. I turn it over and iron it again to make sure it's completely fused down. You want to make sure you've ironed each part of it for at least a couple of seconds, but sometimes it may need a little more time. Next, I'm going to cut the tree line fabric with my brother's scan and cut. My pattern includes the SVG file for digital cutting, but there are also patterns you can print, trace onto fabric with a light tablet and cut using traditional methods. I'm accessing the pattern files. Not everyone with us can and cut will have them at large enough to cut this in one piece. Don't worry, I'll take care of that. So along with my pattern, I've included two sets of SVG files for a digital cutter. One is if you have a larger mat that's 12 inches by 24 inches, in which case you can cut the tree line all in one piece. But you are just using Art 12 by 12 mat. Right, I wanted to show that if you just have a 12 inch by 12 inch mat, you can cut the tree line in two halves and iron them together. I've included an extra set of smaller SVG files for the tree line and other pieces for just that reason. Leave the backing paper on the heat and bond and secure the fabric and the fusible web on the mat, backing paper down. You want to make sure it's really on well, so I'm pressing it down with this little wallpaper roller. That's important for this low tack mat. It is, and I also use scotch tape on the edges just to keep them from pulling up during the cutting. Now I've already loaded up the SVG file I want using the Brother Canvas Workspace application you can download for free and exported them to my scan and cut using the through the internet setting. So the first thing I do with the scan and cut itself is load the mat. Then I click retrieve data and load the shapes to cut from the cloud. Because we're just using the 12 inch by 12 inch mat, I can have it scan the fabric on the mat and place the shape appropriately. Even so, it looked like I needed to adjust the placement a little. Then I wait while the machine cuts the shape out. 
For an intricate shape like this tree line, it's a big help. When it's done, I remove the tape and use a spatula tool to help me get it started so I can peel off the finished shape. It also still has the paper backing on it that you have to remove when you're ready to iron it down. Now for the interfacing pieces, we'll use a larger mat. I cut a piece of interfacing large enough to fit the 12 inches by 24 inches low tack mat for my brother scan and cut. What interfacing are you using for this? This is Pellon SF101. It has a rough side with the glue and a smooth side with just the fabric. You want to make sure to put the smooth side down on the mat. I put it right along the one inch grid line. I'm being pretty careful with the placement because my particular cutter can't scan a piece this large to automatically figure out where to place the shape. You also need to make sure it stays inside the black lines of the mat. I've watched you do this twice and your biggest challenge is always getting the big piece of interfacing onto the mat smoothly. That's a good point. One tip is that I've found I can use this little wallpaper roller to help a little. I also use some scotch tape just on the edges to keep the interfacing from curling up while it's being cut. Now it's the same process for loading the shape up and getting the scanning cut to cut it. But I have to place the shape manually. It can't scan on a mat this large. For this cutting, I'm using Brother's rotary cutter blade. Before we cut the remaining pieces out of the fabrics we've chosen, we need to iron the fusible interfacing to the back of the piece of each fabric. That foreground fabric is our batik. How do you decide which side is the back? Batiks don't always have a right side and a wrong side, so I just pick which way I want the pattern to run. I'm just ironing the fabric flat, then placing the interfacing on the back and ironing it down. Do this slowly and carefully. Getting the layers together evenly without stretching makes a difference in how flat the final quilt will lay. You can see here where I've taken the fabric for the nearest and darkest set of heels cut to size and turned the main edge of the fabric that's going to get stitched down to help assemble this on the overall design. Will that be pieced or applique? It's sort of a combination. I think Sharon Chamber might have called it piece lique because you're just appliquing one edge to help piece the background together. But her technique might also be a little different. Anyway, we have three more pieces of fabric to do this with. Two mountain ranges and this foreground piece. So I can show you the whole process. Let's start with the middle mountain range. I put an M on the interfacing so I need to use it with the middle fabric. Using scissors, cut about a quarter of an inch allowance outside the edge of the interfacing. It doesn't have to be exact because it will fold over the interfacing edge, but it should be close and you don't want it too small to stick. Trim the sides to the edge of the interfacing. Those don't need to be folded over. No, those edges will get covered by the binding at the end. I'm also not cutting off the bottom. We might trim it later, but otherwise it will just hide down under everything else. Now you want to snip cuts in the concave edges of the fabric to help it bend. Don't cut into the interfacing. In fact, try and leave a woven thread or two margin. The convex edges probably won't need it, but anywhere that's a particular bendy curve, it might. Now to stick the edges down, I'll be using this Quilter Select glue stick. I got mine from the quilt show as part of renewing my subscription, but you can get them separately from a couple of suppliers. What are the chopsticks? They aren't chopsticks, but Appliquick's turning rods. The one you use the most is this larger fork-like tool that you use to hold down the interfacing. Then you use this other rod to fold the edge of the fabric over. You can also use the ends to help smooth things out if you have any problems. One end is more of a flat chisel shape. The other end of each rod comes to a sharp point you can use to help move things around. Put a nice even layer of glue down where the edge will need to fall over. Do you want something under that to protect your work surface? Right, I almost forgot. Something like a piece of the backing paper from the Heaton Bond works really well to add some protection from the sticky glue. 
One thing I like about this glue is that it's pretty instant, but that also means it dries fast. So you need to work on one segment of the mountain line at a time and then move on. Also, you don't have to iron it. And it's the same process for the other pieces. Yes, except I'm going to glue the little piece of cliff material onto the foreground as I'm working on this edge. And of course, the tree line we cut earlier will be raw edge applique with the fusible web. It doesn't need this kind of treatment. Part of the edge goes down wrong, you can pull it up before the glue dries, then refold it and replace it. Turn it over on the other side and that will tell you if there's a wrinkle or something that needs to be attended to, but I don't see any of that here. Let's lay out the overall project so we know how everything fits together to make the completed background. I put down the assembly guide in back and I can see it through some of the fabric, but you probably can't see that on camera. As you add more layers, the placement will be harder to see but you can figure it out by lifting the edges and finding where each side of the next piece goes down. Now I'm going to use some Roxanne basting glue to set each of these in place long enough to stitch it. You want to be careful with the glue, but you don't have to worry too much because it both dries clear and washes out. How do you want to deal with the foreground? You need to be able to iron down the tree line first. For now, I'm going to mark the placement of the tree line and the foreground with chalk, and then I'll come back to those later after I've stitched down the first parts. I also need to iron a little just to set the basting glue while I'm working with it.
Now it's time to stitch down the mountain lines permanently with some lightweight threads in the 80 to 100 weight range. I picked different threads looking between my collections and doing some shopping to find threads in the right colors for these fabrics. I've installed a 9014 top stitch needle that works well with these lighter weight threads. For this first fabric, the farthest mountain range, I found a matching color in an 80 weight Wonderfill polyester called Deco Bob. I'm also using a 20D open toed embroidery foot, but I need a narrow overlock stitch to keep the applique stitching as discreet as possible. Odette? Right, I'm setting stitch 1331. It's a narrow blind stitch designed just for this kind of thing. Perfect, thanks. I've selected the 20D foot as well. Do you want to move the needle all the way to the right, as usual? Yes, I'd like to be able to have the inside edge of the foot follow the edge of the applique. Time to change threads. Are we sticking with the same stitch? Yes, all our settings will stay the same for these next two mountain ranges. But we'll be using Superior Micro Quilter, a 100 weight poly thread in colors that match these fabrics. Now I've ironed on the tree line, which was backed with the fusible web, and we'll need to stitch it down. I'll still use the 20D foot and the 9014 top stitch needle, but I've switched to a dark green 40 weight polyester thread called Magnifico. This stitch line is going to be a bit more visible because we want it to leave the impression of a silhouette of pine needles. You'll need a different stitch for that. Right, maybe a double blanket stitch. Of course. I think you want 1352, so I'm setting it up now. This is probably the toughest stitching in the whole project. There are a lot of start and stop turns where you want to turn on a sharp corner with the needle down. With a little practice and patience though, you can work through it fairly easily. None of it is particularly difficult, it's just repetitive. But it should look good when you're done.
So off camera, I went back and put the gray foreground fabric in place with the temporary glue along the chalk line we made earlier, and then stitched it down using the same method we used for the mountain range. I used a 100 weight gray silk thread, which I had on hand already. It didn't take too much to stitch down this one piece. Unfortunately, I just forgot to push record on the camera. You didn't miss much. It's just like the mountains you did before. We even went back to the same hand look applique stitch for this section because it has a turned edge. Now I just need to stitch down the brown inset fabric that represents the side of the cliff you can see. Again, I'm using a 100 weight silk, just in brown this time. Is there anything else you need to do to get the background ready to add the evergreen trees? No, I think that's it. I hope you enjoyed this first part of my landscape skill building project. At this point, we have the whole background prepared and are ready so that next time we can work on the foreground trees. Do you want to tell people how you're going to do that? Not yet. I have a new technique worked up for this that I'm looking forward to showing off, but I want to devote a whole episode to it. Until then, I'm going to let it be a surprise. Don't forget to subscribe. You don't want to miss that. Thanks, Odette. And thanks to all of you who have already subscribed. For those of you who haven't, please do. And remember to click the like button if you enjoyed this. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, please post them. Until next time, have fun in your studios.